Awesome. Patrick, leading us into a good next question. So are there any products or designs that you wish to see come to fruition, but for some reason isn't feasible for cost or for another reason? You're saying personal, like personally are a design or like ones that we see? Yeah, called. I would say either. If you've thought of something, but haven't been able, I mean, you know, if you're still going to continue to try, you don't have to share, obviously, but have you tried something that just wasn't feasible? I, I know Patrick has, has tried a few things, for example, that just either took way longer to, to eventually create because it took, it was too expensive or anything along those lines or something that you'd like to see that no one's done before just because it's tough to do for us. So, um, I have a palette over here, probably six products that are 95% done mm. that I have not continued to revisit due to. We call it the graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, that's what uh, I'm looking for, <laughs> but yeah, so, I, you don't have to share that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, mainly due to the cost aspect. And I'm sure everyone here knows that when you develop higher quality or innovative stuff, it usually costs more, which means there's slimmer margins and all that. So I have a trap bar that I made like two and a half years ago that's sitting here that I want to share and show people about because it's the thing that I think is the coolest. But if it costs me 450 bucks in materials, and buying 500 of them to get it going and have to sell for 1300 bucks. That's a pretty big investment with something like that, especially for a new product. And there's a lot of risk involved there. And then also, um, the other one is that gyre that we made because the cost of that thing is pretty high. Can you grab it? Oh, it's, it's right over. I think she's grabbing it. I'll it's a barbell it. carousel and it's just like, I spend everyone. Oh, here that knows. thing. Yeah. Yeah, just like when. Do you um, want to hear how quiet it is? <laughs> sure. Got it, dude. That yeah. thing's rad, dude. That, that is stuff. sweet, dude. You know what, Steve? Hold on. Seeing that actually makes me think about something. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that Pure Strength barbell holder. Y'all remember that company, Pure Strength? They had like the brackets with the like dash as their logo, and they had that round barbell Did thing. The whole thing. It, it, it didn't spin though. And I was always like, oh, that'd be sick. Uh, if, like we made that, but we made it spin. And so seeing that, that's just kind of cool. And Steve, side note, Steve, I see that intercooler you got there in the background. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's I do. that for? I, Completely off topic. Uh, <laughs> I'm a car guy. So the new Shelby GT350. I do a lot of uh, development. No, that's because I didn't love it. Yeah, that's, that's the intercooler for one of those kits. Um, so I do a lot of outside of the fitness stuff. I do a lot of development and like fabrication for a company that does high-end supercharger systems for like Lamborghini, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, and all that stuff. So right I, have, on, I probably have like two dozen of those intercoolers here. I do these M5 BMW manifolds, but uh, yeah, I just do a lot of, a lot of the tube work and stuff like that. So that's, that's where my fabrication background comes from mainly is development of automotive parts. On the gyre, the thing I think is the coolest that it's so hard to display to people and explain. It's probably easier on a call. So like this is what the bottom of that plate looks like. So I made, I designed it so that you could basically upgrade. So this, if you just say you have th you want to, you have three barbells, you look at whatever number, Roman numeral has three and you bolt three to this and it evenly distributes them. And then if you want four, you unbolt it and then put them in the perspective bolt holes for four and it goes up to seven. So it's something that you could buy, put three barbells in, and then buy another barbell, buy an additional sleeve, bolt it to here, and like something you can grow with in that sense. Dude, that's super cool, man. It yeah. reminds me of a clock or like a sundial. <laughs> I, I've talked to Dylan about this quite a bit, or just here and there actually, but I <sighs> see a lot of potential with that to really store specialty bars if you can space it right. Because specialty bars, if you put them on a traditional like nine bar holder and you actually have nine other barbells, it's really hard to get a few specialty bars in there. So if you can get something like that spaced out, I can, I can definitely see the specialty mar bar market people really I actually have a throw in a couple of ab mat pillows. Yeah. <laughs> barbell pillows. <laughs> yeah. We've, we've actually, Oh, you have it. I have a picture and a post that we tried that we set up, we put on a, like a, 
easy curl bar, a transformer yeah. bar, and a bunch of other specialty bars. And I think we were still able to fit. Oh, nice. Most yeah. On there. You just have to strategically place them. But uh, the the whole point of like the the gyre that I was trying to help for like the home gym people is just compactness of space. And the fact that it can, that it has a small footprint and it rotates, you can put it in like a corner somewhere and be able to reach the rear barbell without having to like, you know. Yeah, looks awesome too. Dude, yeah, that thing looks sweet. I designed yeah. a, uh, actually I have SolidWorks file of uh, a seal row bench that is foldable and you can convert it into a standard flat utility, extend the legs out to turn it into a seal row bench and it also folds in so you can put it up onto a wall. But I never had any intention of making it. I just, uh, I made it. I thought I'd someday send it to Bridge Built and see if they wanted to make it. But uh, I know he's got a lot on his plate, so I figured I'd wait for him to reach out and ask to collab on something. But can you drive it to work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that, Patrick designs it. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that sounds odd. Dude, we've been we've been doing a bunch of seal rows, but you know, in our training, but we just stack like our mini plyo boxes and a flat bench. So I mean, yeah, Dylan, I mean, I'm 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 ready to start look you know looking at that whenever you are, dog. I'll, I'll email it to you right now. Don't don't judge my solid work skills. It's nowhere near. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. It was just one of those ideas you got to write down to see so you can visualize it. Dude, it's all good, man. I have a seal row question actually. So I've dabbled with the design of a seal row, but it's probably something I'm not going to even entertain at this point. But I noticed everyone puts the hooks on the inside of the frame for to put the barbell, which means that every time you put the barbell on the seal row, you have to like feed it underneath the um, the bench. I was like, well, why don't you offset those uprights and put the hooks in the front? They need to be behind you. If you're ever doing a seal row and you're trying to, if you got some serious weight on it, going out like this is a lot harder than going inwards and swinging in, inside. So I've always thought it was stupid that all these companies are putting the hooks out in front of you uh, because in, in, in actuality, because once you put it on the hooks underneath you, it, it jacks it up enough so you can load the weights and change the weights as you're doing it also. So yeah. uh, the barbell insertion has never been a major issue for me. I just always wondered, why in the world does everybody keep putting out in front of you? I got seven pins in my left shoulder and the right one pops out if I give an aggressive high five. And every time I went to re-rack my, my uh, barbell after doing some seal rows, I would I would feel my, my, my shoulders slip out of their joints. So Interesting. Um, yeah, because I didn't actually do any experimenting. But to me, it just visually, I'm looking like, doesn't that make, wouldn't that make it a lot easier just to set up? But I guess it would have to really have the perfect geometry in order to not do what you said in regards to like shoulder injuries and awkwardness all right pictures coming your way patrick oh yeah dude awesome making deals on the call <laughs> <laughs> all right and uh if you guys don't have anything else for that one let's do one more question yeah um, you know what real quick i i, I yeah. do want to I, I i did have an answer to that you know because essentially you know we're all talking about a lot of things that um you know we tried to do and essentially they might be cost prohibitive or something along those lines and you know, I feel like I'm in the same boat. We have like a binder that's super thick and it, it's, it's what I realize it's not so much the, the cost, it's just finding like, you know, the time, the people, and that's essentially where we feel like we're limited most is just time and people. But from a, from a cost standpoint, I would personally love to see essentially like a, a, a molded rubber bumper plate that is uh, made in the United States. And, you know, I've, I've talked with several different people about this and I actually had a conversation with one of our vendors about it yesterday, but it's just, I have a good buddy that works closely with a lot of big companies like Sorenex, Rogue, Play, like some of these other people. And he was explaining to me that I think a while back, Sorenex tried to create a bumper plate facility here in the United States. But once it was all said and done to be profitable on selling bumper plates, they would need to charge somewhere in the neighborhood of like $20 a pound, just because a, not only the machinery, but the filtration systems that the United States EPA requires for all those fumes that come from the rubber from the cost that you would have to pay the employees to work there, it's just super cost prohibitive. So that's why all those bumper plates are made in China because they don't have any sort of regulation for that kind of stuff. And then you can get them pretty cheap. So- um, Talking about other than other than crumb bumpers. Yeah, yeah, uh, other than crumb. Yeah, kind of like, 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 yeah, like the bumpers that you see, you know, in the back, in, in Jake's background, like that, 
molded yeah the year rubber yeah 100 um so you know and i know that they have some urethane ability here in the united states and in canada primarily you know what you see with the soronex bosco bumpers but like doing that rubber I honestly have no idea. That's not really my expertise or wheelhouse, but it would be cool to be able to offer something like that that is American made. But I guess only, you know, we'll just have to see sometime in the future because I don't think people are going to want to pay $20 a pound for bumpers. So, <laughs> well, not, not when you can manufacture a urethane dumbbell for less than $2 a pound in China. Right. That, right. Those are real numbers. I just had them quoted. Yeah. I mean, yeah. bumper, urethane bumper plates are, are more, more expensive. They're like $1.85. To get mm -hmm. produced, something like that, you know, under two bucks, uh, a urethane dumbbell is like a dollar and a quarter to get produced in China at scale. Now that's before shipping, VAT tax, and all that stuff. But I mean, total cost of ownership is under four dollars a pound for sure uh, on all that urethane all right. stuff. But it has to come from China. So just as a cost comparison, five exit to get in the U.S. That's yeah. No, I mean it's <clears throat> and, and 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 it's not really so much the material per se. It's just you know from the just the higher standards of, you know, labor that we have here. And, and infrastructure for sure. Right. So, you know, that's, it's just, yeah, I, you know, most people just don't know that, you know, so it, it is, it is, you know, pretty crazy, you know, when, uh, you know, we think about things like that, but. We do a lot anyway. of molding and it always comes down to machine time is the greatest cost. You know, our medicine balls are, takes about 30 minutes uh, in a tool just to be able to make one of our medicine balls, which is why we have five tools. So that the, the machine operator doesn't have to sit there and wait for 30 minutes. You can always continually move down a line and, and, and work on the other four when the other one's cooking. But um, the, And urethane is very expensive. The answer to molding urethane in the United States is not going to be making urethane plates. Um, I think it's going to be making steel plates and then over molding them with the urethane coating. Uh, so there's not direct to metal contact with your floors and you're going to be able to decrease the size of the bumper plates quite substantially and then you can oversize the hole and crimp in one of those sleeves and pinch it on both sides to make it look substantially like a, a urethane plate. But that would be easily accessible, especially if you got your laid down steel from China and then molded the urethane here. Interesting. Well, yeah, again, good lead up into the last question. So can you all just explain why USA manufacturing